Hello. Hey, I guess I can take my rain hat off. It's raining all day today. Well, since noon, it's been raining. It's about, I don't know, three, four o'clock now. So, uh, hi, another uh, midweek chat. We got, what is it, July 14th. It is the feast of St. Kateri Tekakwitha in the church. Uh, the first Native American saint, so from our land here where we live. Um, I was going to talk about her a bit later, but maybe I'll talk about it a little bit later. So, yeah, I hope you can maybe hear. I'm under a bridge, so it's dry. I was looking. For, I wanted to go to Mount Tom again. I've never been there, and it wasn't raining real hard. And then on the way there, it started raining pretty hard. And I thought, huh. So again, I'm thwarted to get to Mount Mount Tom. Uh, but sometime soon, I hope. Um, well, I think. Uh, this is good for gardens, right? The rain. Uh, how many of you have gardens or flowers? We got, I almost decided to sit in front of our new plant. Uh, Louise uh, told me, if you buy it, we'll plant it. And I, I wanted a hibiscus plant. And we got a couple. And one of them just came out. I like to say the blossoms are as big as Buicks. But uh, no kidding. You know, this, the blossoms are this big. You probably know what hibiscus are, but it's, I mean, it's big. Big uh, burgundy colored one we have. Right, uh, it's right uh, outside the main entrance of the church, right on 11th Street there. If you ever want to check it out, I'll maybe do a chat in front of the uh, hibiscus blooms in the coming weeks. Um, but I'm growing this basil, you know, which is really doing well. And thanks, Sharon, for watering it when I'm gone and stuff. But um, those darn uh, green Japanese beetle bugs. Man, whenever I walk by, they're just all over those, and they got holes in them, and they're, they're chewing them up. I even found one on the hibiscus bloom today, so uh, I've never had such problems with those bugs. I hate to just squash them, but I hate to let them just have their way with things that I value too. So it's tough out there in nature, isn't it? But anyway, so those are some little things. Uh, what's going on in the parish? Um, we just finished up today. Uh, Beth couldn't be there. Beth. Beth's looking like this today because she's had her wisdom teeth taken out. So Beth, hope you are feeling better. Um, and uh, so Kelly kind of rounded things up with her youth volunteers. Uh, oh gosh, so Loken, I can't remember her first name now, and, and Joey Rent, and there's a bunch of bunch of good youth volunteers. She told me a nice story today. There's there's this one uh, girl. I don't know. She's about seven years old, maybe six, and. Uh, She's been a, a little bit of a, a, a very active, sometimes a challenge for the volunteers to kind of have go along with the program kind of thing. And um, anyway, uh, as, as Kelly was telling the story, it was snack time, you know, after the Bible stories came snack time. They're there mainly for the Bible stories, but snacks are icing on the cake, right? And uh, anyway, they were handing them out and there were some people at Rice Krispie Treats and some people got who knows what, let's say, uh, golf, uh, molasses cookies. So anyway, this one uh, girl gets a molasses cookie and she starts getting a little upset. Not, not the one I was talking about, but another one. And uh, apparently the Bible story was something, was something that they were trying to learn that day about being generous and being loving your neighbors, yourself, those kind of things. Anyway, so this one girl said, oh, I really wanted a Rice Krispie, I wanted a Rice Krispie treat. I wanted a Rice Krispie treat. And uh, and then this other girl who, you know, can be somewhat difficult to manage, I guess. She, she said, oh, I have a Rice Krispie treat. You can have mine. And then Kelly said, and I know that this girl, the one who gave it away, loves Rice Krispie treats, you know? So she really had to dig deep for something that she really loved and, and gave it away, you know, and got stuck with the molasses cookie. So, I told him when I heard that story, I said, I hate it when six-year-olds are more mature than I am. You know, I mean, that, that's great. I mean, there's a fine line there, you know, you don't always want to just, um, I don't know, be what? You're not always, we gotta, you know, we love our neighbor as ourselves. We don't want to get into a thing where it's like, we're always trying to deny ourselves. So, that, But it is a very Christian thing. And, and to be free enough to do that is very important. And I think that's why we have those uh, Lenten disciplines and we, we try to fast so we don't get too attached to those things. Anyway, I saw this free act of love where I heard about it and I thought it was really uh, beautiful. So that's some really good fruit from our Bible Buddies summer program. 
um, that we could all learn from, especially uh, the little girl's pastor. Boy, if I get some food I really like, it's hard to just say, oh, here, you have it. Um, but I'll work on it, I'm inspired. Uh, so that was good. Um, on a similar vein, so maybe back to Kateri, I have this, I have this in a Ziploc because uh, it was raining, I didn't get, want to get it wet, but I love the colors in this art. This is from a place called Trinity Icons, and so it's not really the classic Byzantine style, and I know some people that are really curious about icons don't really like Trinity Icons so much, but I, I do. And uh, anyway, this is an image of um, Kateri, St. Kateri. So you can see she's sitting in a canoe and she's holding a cross and uh, moonlight reflecting off the water. Yeah, that was very, very beautiful. So Kateri lived in the 17th century and she, um, uh, I think a Christian mother, I think, and then a, a, a Mohawk non-Christian uh, father. And um, well, there was a lot of war and a lot of violence and those things. And uh, she, um, this is upstate New York. In fact, I, I've ever been to Orysville. It's not so far from Albany. It's probably like an hour, hour and a half drive west of Albany. Um, very important place to the Jesuit, Jesuit order because that's where the North American martyrs were martyred. St. Isaac Job, St. John de Brebeuf, some others. Uh, anyway, she grew up in that village. And, um, you know, then she turned a teen and there was hostilities and, um, you know, they wanted her to marry a, a, a man of the tribe who was not Christian and she refused and that never makes you popular. And so um, I was glad they let her refuse though. There was a smallpox epidemic when she was a little girl, she survived, but it left her face kind of disfigured. And so she had, you know, a lot of challenges growing up. But by the time she was a late teen, um, she heard the gospel presented very powerfully and uh, she became Christian and was baptized. And she used to like to talk about it the wonders of being baptized, baptized, what a wonderful thing that is to experience forgiveness and union with God and his people. So, um, you know, she had a fair amount of suffering though and persecution because she was Christian. She ended up going, um, she met a lot of the right people at the right time, I think. And somebody knew that uh, there was a, a village for Christian uh, Indians, but what I should say first, they had, this, they had this treaty, which was kind of neat with the, the, I think it was the U.S. government and the uh, Native Americans there, that uh, in times of war and in the midst of all these hostilities, if they took, if they had Christian prisoners, if they took Christians as prisoners, they had to allow them to have a chaplain. And so all these, these uh, villages were, uh, ha had Catholic chaplains, usually like a Jesuit priest. So, and they set her up and, and they sent her to a Montreal, basically, what's now Montreal, and she lived with other Christians. And she died when she was 24, so she didn't have a long life, even as a Christian, maybe four or five years, um, but maintained her um, single singular devotion to God. So at Mass this morning, we prayed the preface for virgins and religious. She never became a nun. She thought about starting a religious order, but the priest said, no, nah, don't do that. So she didn't. and. Um, so just kind of ordinary life devoted to God. And, uh, you know, a lot, of our, a lot of our saints, when they read their stories, it talks about how they uh, wouldn't marry. And so they maintain their virginity. And, uh, you know, Bishop Callahan, when he talks to us priests, he always tries to encourage us in our, our celibacy and our being single. And he says, never underestimate your witness as single, chaste men. Um, in this world, this hypersexualized world that we're in, and I think I think the same is true, you know, with these saints who are are, are virgins and uh, never married, and um, you know, it just gives gives what can give hope or just a, a sense that you know a full life doesn't have to be a, a, an active life in that way. There's other ways to be loving. There's other ways to use that that energy, you know, for God and for love of others. So I thought, you know, kind of beautiful story of uh, St. Kateri Tekakwitha. I looked where she was um, buried, and she's buried on just a little, I think it's a reservation area. It's, it's right, it's very near Montreal, and I had been to Montreal some years ago. I wish I'd known, would have seen it. She just made a saint in 2012, canonized uh, by Pope Benedict. But um, So it's kind of maybe a lot on her, maybe it wasn't that interesting, but um, the, first, the first Native American saint. Um, and it, it reminded me of the story, though. Uh, there's a movie called Black Robe. 
and it's about uh, the, these Jesuit missionaries in the time of Kateri Tekakwitha. I don't think she's a character in it. But you know, they want to have, they want to make Christians out of the non-Christian native population. And some of them are more hard-nosed about it, like, you know, hell or high water, we're gonna get these people baptized and save their souls. And we have a kind of a different approach to uh, missionary work in our church now. It's more like witnessing to Christ, trying to convert by attraction, you know, not by coercion. And uh, anyway, so there was this plague coming out and there was this priest who was, he was a lot of pressure. You gotta convert these, these uh, native peoples and the indigenous to the land. And, and so he wanted to do that and at the time of a plague. And one way that he could do it, he could manipulate them. He could promise them that if they were baptized, they would heal their plague, that they wouldn't get sick and die. He like knew that wasn't probably true. Maybe he thought maybe it could be a miracle or something, but I think he had enough of a scientific mind where prayer doesn't prevent all disease. And uh, so he had a, this, they were all kind of lined up and he said, we will be baptized if, if you promise us we'll be cured. It's, to me, it's the high point of this movie. And the priest looks out there and he sees all these people and he could just probably count the numbers. Boy, I can tell headquarters I baptized 300 people today, you know? But something about his conscience, uh, well formed, he said, I can't lie, I can't lie to this chief. And he said, I, I cannot promise you that. And, uh, and then the chief kind of was stunned because he thought he would hear yes. And this is probably a little Hollywood because I'm not sure a 17th century Indian chief would say this to a missionary, but after he heard that the baptism wouldn't cure them, he said, um, do you love us? Do you love us? And uh, and the missionary said, yes. You know, and he was so relieved to be able to say something affirming that was true, you know, from the bottom of his heart. Yes, I love you. And then the, the chief just kind of gave his nod to everybody and everybody came out of their canoes and they all lined up to be baptized by this priest. Um, so anyway, I always remember that scene. That was really great. So our sacraments, you know, they're not magic. You know, they gotta have love as their base. God is love and God is what we celebrate in those sacraments. And uh, anyway, well, kind of an interesting story, I hope to hear a little bit. Um, speaking of times of war and difficulty, I visited some time ago, but I saw them again today. So we have these great couple, they're in their 90s, but they walk more miles than I do every day. Uh, so Jim and artist Rodell, they live across the street from church and uh, they're always out walking. And uh, he was a World War II tail gunner, you know, so he had to, you know, enter into that, that terror of what, what war is really like. And, and uh, you know, with a lot of dedication, a lot of courage and, and, uh, and if any, if there was any target that the German army wanted to shoot down, it was his plane, you know? because uh, his plane was just, just uh, doing a lot of damage to Germany. So anyway, it's just something that, he showed me a lot of pictures of it and everything, and he's, I'm not sure how old he is now, I think he's like 96 or something. And um, I just love talking to him, because he, he's just so, you can just tell, it's like, you know, everything since then has been gravy. Everything has just been gravy. I mean, I, I don't know why I survived that war. Most, a lot of my uh, people I served with died in the war and uh, somehow I survived and, uh, and here I am. And I just think he has this sense, like every, everything since then is just a bonus, you know, just a heart full of gratitude. Don't worry about the little stuff, you know, be a loving guy, a faithful guy and don't get too worried about things. So he's, it's a, he's got a beautiful spirit to kind of catch, you know. Um, yeah, he, he reminded me, and, and I think that's a lot like how we could all, you know, we don't all survive war when we probably should have died and most people were aiming for us, but um, St. Paul talks about our baptism, right? That we die with Christ. If we die with Christ, we might live with him. If we die with Christ in baptism, then the Lord will raise us to new life to live for him. 
And that's just, that's just the whole way of, of looking at it too. I mean, is our baptism, is our conversion, is our Christian spirituality uh, include that idea that, you know, our lives are not about us. We kind of die to this. You know, we say we do, but it's, we're, you know, we're so ego-centered as people. We're always worried about ourselves. But in theory, you know, we die to that ego-centered life. That we might live generously for others in communion with others, in communion with God. We die to self, that we might rise and live for others and live for God. Like that little girl with the Rice Krispie treat, you know? And, uh, you know, anyway, so I, 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 even though he went through all that, I thought, you know, that's how we're all supposed to live. I remember I, I was in a car accident when I first year of seminary, and I, I woke up at the side of the road after being unconscious for several minutes, and uh, I missed like six weeks of school. And I remember thinking, you know, I, I could have died and uh, easily. And um, I should live like I could have died and I didn't. And like I was brought back to life and I just live a bold life that isn't afraid of anything, you know, because it's all bonus time. And, you know, so you have those thoughts, but it's just, man, it's hard, to, it's hard to live like that without fear and not worrying about ourselves. So I know I haven't achieved that yet. Um, and talking to Jim, I thought of Father Blecka he was a pastor in Menominee for years where I was, and he lived to be 104 months old. And ever since he was 94 or something, I, I heard him often talk, and he'd often include this story. He'd say, uh, yeah, I'm the only one from my class, class of 1940, that's still living. Everyone else died. I think the one who died last died 12 years ago. And uh, he goes, I think they're up there. They probably think I didn't make it. <laughs> Like I didn't make it to heaven. Like the Father Black, Charlie went the other way, you know. Anyway, I always got a laugh from people. I thought it was funny. Maybe you did. Um, anyway, what else we got here? Ooh, some kind of thoughts. I didn't really get the parish news so much. Oh, one other non-parish news. The hybrids. They're going to fix the hybrids. I don't know if that's politically controversial or not because it's expensive. Maybe $2.5 million, they're thinking. But what a treasure the hybrids is in Eau Claire. For me, you know, oh, it's, it's close to St. James, and it, 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 it's this recreational bridge that goes over the Chippewa River, very high. And I, whenever I have out of town guests, it's the first place I take them. Uh, it's just beautiful. Our parish bike rides go over it. Anyway, they closed it like three weeks ago because of structural problems, and they, they voted to uh, to repair it. So selfishly, perhaps, but I'm, I'm I was really glad to do that. Um, our, our mass, uh, our intention for mass this morning was for Charlie. And uh, he died of COVID in the fall. And I just thought, boy, you know, if we're in COVID running around, Charlie would still be around, he'd be coming to Mass. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I know, I don't know, I'm not, I still don't quite understand all the angles on it, but I, I know that COVID is spreading where vaccination rates are low. And so to me, it, it makes sense. I, I know people have their reasons, and I don't mean to uh, intrude on people's consciences, but I guess priests are supposed to try to, I know the Vatican and the U.S. bishops are all asking us to promote vaccinations. And so I, I hope you will. I mean, I think it's, it's, for, the, it's for the common good. And uh, I'm sorry if that offends anybody. But I, again, the statistics are just kind of right there that it's, uh, it saves lives. So it seems to be uh, part of our pro-life ethic uh, to pursue that. So, um, okay, other, other stuff. Book club tonight. You won't, you won't know. It'll be over by the time you watch this. But uh, I'm thinking about our next book being on uh, Jesus' parables. There's a new book out by Liturgical Press. It's a little scholarly, but I think I don't think it's really shooting over people's heads. But it's called. Uh, it's by Gerhard Lofink. But anyway, more on that later. Um, mass. Uh, so we went along with mass. People said uh, after mass, they said, "Hey, it's a long time ago." They said, "Hey, can we just get a cup of coffee?" Uh, Boy, just among our friends that we know we're all vaccinated and stuff, can you just get a pot of coffee? And I thought, well, might not look good to everybody. So, but I think we're gonna, you know, if, if people wanna do that and you have your friends, it's your choice. I think you wanna make a pot of coffee. I don't know if we'll be able to have this hospitality as we knew it right away, where people make treats and make the coffee for you. But um, I think people can start hanging around the gathering space um, after mass, uh, it's your choice, you know. Um, some people have been wanting to do that. Uh, someone asked me, you know, when are we gonna get the songbooks back? And, you know, we're, we've been kind of wishy-washy with the singing, you know, because you get the, the singing and the, and the air out there. And, uh, you know, the virus can spread by air. 
And so right now we're not really, we're not saying don't sing and we're not saying sing. I think most people understand that um, it's not awful to sing along if you know the song, but we're kind of asking you not to go like full bore, full voice. Um, so I'm probably guilty of, but I feel like I'm far away from people where I am, so I, I kind of let her let her rip. But um, we may get we may get some books back in the views, so you can read along. The lyrics are beautiful, a lot of our music, so we're kind of uh, discerning that as we as we go along. Uh, I do miss uh, calling people by name at communion time, and I don't want to do the speaking unless I'm masked. So maybe some weekends I'll mask, and then you know I don't. Unfortunately, I don't know everybody's name. That's always the problem, but. You know, I like to say, you know, you know, body of Christ, Peggy, you know. Um, and so right now we're doing the communal amen. And people, I think people like that. What I'm hearing is people like that. I like that. I like affirming with one another the, our faith and the real presence of Jesus before we receive as a community. I think it's beautiful. But anyway, that's something I'm discerning as well. Um, Kelly tells me we need catechists for next year. We need one ninth grade catechist to help the confirmation process begin and facilitate small group. Uh, more elementary catechists are needed. Um, so if, if that might be a call of yours, I think it's very challenging, but I, think it's, I know it's very important. So if it's something you might uh, feel called to, use your talents for the good of our youth, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, we are nearing the end of our collection of school supplies for the Eau Claire School District. Um, there's a list of what to bring in the back of the gathering space. You can always call Christine. She knows all about that. Um, this weekend was going to be the last weekend, but they've extended it one weekend out. So there's a little time yet if you want to get your uh, markers and rulers. And I'm not sure if school supplies are the same now as when I was a kid. Probably not. What do we always need? An eraser, a pencil case, pencil, pencils. Is that it? I can't think of anything else we would have. Notebooks, you know, a lot of notebooks. Yeah, I remember I felt I was growing up when we went from wide line notebooks to college rule. That was pretty good. I never made it to narrow rule, so. There's still some room for growth there, I guess. Um, let's see, Jonah. So joining our neighbors, affirming hope. Is that what a Jonah stands for? It's a nice group. It's an ecumenical group in Eau Claire that um, advocates for the poor and legislation and, and building relationships. They tried to build uh, relationships, I think, quite successfully between the Altoona uh, police and, and uh, um, immigrants who are maybe afraid of the police, and police want to say, well, they don't have to be afraid of us, you know, and Eau Claire police as well, and, and, and this population. That's an example of something they do, I think they work on, try to, uh, um, how to help uh, ex-prisoners find uh, housing and find a life outside of prison, so it's to help their chances of succeeding in life after prison. Um, Low-income housing, there's an environmental task force, so they do a lot of things that are, are, are really good for vulnerable people in our uh, society. And, um, and we support them. The Eau Claire uh, Deanery of Catholic Parishes supports them. And um, anyway, they're having a thrift sale. It's going to be on Otis Street at a parishioner's house. And uh, it starts tomorrow, Thursday, uh, July 15th. It'll be all day Thursday on Otis Street. So if, you, if, you're, if you're around St. James, you go like uh, St. James on 11th. And if you go to uh, 11th and Folsom, and then you head west, you'll bump into Otis, and then just turn right in Otis and you'll see signs. So it's all day Thursday, and then Friday morning. And then at noon, here's the thing. If there's anything left, and I guess there's a lot of good stuff, then they're just gonna give it away. You can take whatever you want for free on noon Friday. So you could show up just on, on noon and Friday, but, you know, the good stuff will have sold. So it's kind of how you wanna play it, you know? Maybe do both, come early, come late. That's probably the best thing. Anyway, so that's a, a good thing to support. Um, I told you about my basil bugs. Well, I just I did want to mention. So we have one uh, uh, friend of a friend of the chat, or someone that I know from Wausau. He was a friend of my brother's who watches the chat. Yeah, named Dan, and his uh, his wife died this week, and she had been uh, ill with cancer. And uh, we sent him a shipment of the olive oil from the, the Holy Land, and. Uh, Anyway, very, very, very tender time. So just yesterday that she died on Tuesday um, in, in Arizona. Uh, so we remember Sue. As we pray uh, at the end of funerals or at burials. Eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. 
may it be so. Okay, so remembering this image of the great Kateri clinging to the cross, we try to maintain our communion with Christ. We know that uh, the fullness of life isn't just by trying to increase our own health, our own wealth, our own status, but it's clinging to the cross and giving ourselves away, whether it's a Rice Krispie treat or accepting adversity with faith and doing the best we can, all these things. On this rainy day, sheltered in this uh, bridge on these rocks, uh, I wish you peace. Maybe we'll close with a little Taze chant. Within our darkest night, you kindle a fire that never dies away, that never dies away. Within our darkest night, you kindle a fire that never dies away, that never dies away. Within our darkest night, you kindle a fire that never dies away, that never dies away. Within our darkest night, you kindle a fire that never dies away, that never dies away. Within our darkest night, you kindle a fire that never dies away, that never dies away. Within our darkest night, you kindle a fire that never dies away, that never dies away. God bless you on this feast of Catering.